Mike Cohen, and welcome to our local author series for the Colte Loop Public Library. It's a pleasure to have Samuel S. Cloto with me today. And I've known Sam for many years. Uh, I knew you were a financial advisor. I knew that you're the brother of uh, party planning legend, Harry Cloda. I knew you lived in Hampstead, but I was not aware of your expertise and your fascination with the atomic bomb. Yet here's your new book, a fantastic read, which is now going to be available at the Coastal Public Library. And we'll see what the demand is. We may have to get more than one book. The Atomic Bomb and Images and Documents, The Manhattan Project, and the Bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Of course, I was familiar with the subject. Most people are. I didn't know all the details. I did see The Manhattan Project, the, uh, the, the TV series that uh, aired on Crave. It's still on Crave right now. Uh, but wow, this book really summarized the history in a very simple and understandable fashion. So Sam, what prompted you to write the book? That's my first question. Well, I remember March 21st, 2020, almost, uh, almost two years from today, I was sitting uh, in the kitchen with my wife drinking coffee, watching Fox News, and they interviewed a doctor the doctor was asked, how long do you think this uh, virus uh, could take place? How long will it last? And in my mind, I thought, you know, one or two months, it'll be over, uh, no, no big deal. He said, one, two, three years, maybe longer. Finished my coffee, I went to my room and I said, I'm gonna be locked up here for a year, two years, what am I gonna do? I know mathematics and I worked in Washington. I know atomic bombs, I said, you know what? I will write a book on atomic bombs. I went to my wife, I told her what I'm gonna do, and she says, nobody's gonna print it. Huh. I went to my little office, I phoned my, my oldest niece, Dr. Lori Cloda, she works in uh, Concordia, she has a PhD in library science. I asked her who's the biggest publisher in the States on military books, she said McFarland Publishers. Went to my computer, found the phone number, got an assistant editor, told him I wanted to write a book. I said, would you publish it? He said, it doesn't work that way. He says, you write it, you send it to us. And by the way, we take one book out of something like 42 books. I said, that's not gonna work. I said, what's your fax number? He said, what do you want the fax number for? I said, give me the email or fax number. I'm gonna send you a few documents I have in my possession. Sent them the email with about four pictures and two documents. He called me back in about an hour. He says, what do you want? So I want a contract. He negotiated a contract on the phone. In an hour, I had my written contract. Went to my wife, I showed it to her, said, leave me alone. Don't call me during the day except for a meal. Just, it was like, you know, I remember when I did my master's degree in mathematics, I told my parents, do not talk to me. Leave me alone. Huh. She basically left me alone for 14 months. Wow. At the end of 14 months, I sent it to Washington. I said, I want to publish this book. They took out about eight pictures that they thought were not appropriate or were not uh, classified in uh, the proper manner. They took out a few letters to change a few things sent it to the publisher and was published uh, in February 18, 2022. Wow, so uh, that's quite quite the uh, the journey. So Sam, you spent uh, 40 years meeting with the scientists who built the first atomic bombs, the crews that delivered them to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. What was that like? Great, I got to know all the scientists, all the crews. Uh, became their friends, uh, met them on different occasions, wrote letters, and I saved everything. I never thought I'd have to write a book on it. I saved it, I knew one day I, I'll donate it to their uh, University of um, New Mexico or University of Chicago. And that, that's my plan to donate these uh, items. Sam, the, the Manhattan Project, as mentioned, uh, I watched the show, it's hard to believe it's hard to believe that it was not just a TV show and not just movies, but this happened in real life. A secret program to build an atomic bomb 
in the Manhattan Project, what I saw was in New Mexico, they created uh, a little city. Families lived there. They built the bomb. Uh, there was all kinds of uh, conspiracy theories and military police. It was quite something and it was real. Uh, I mean, you obviously have been fascinated with this for a long time, but it's really hard to believe in this day and age that they actually did something like that. About 100,000 people worldwide worked on this project. After about um, 70 odd years, they only found five people who were like spies for Russia. The last spy I put in my book uh, was uh, if the CIA found them in 2010. Really? That recently? Yeah. Wow, wow. But uh, the, the, the fact is that it's amazing how they were able to do something in such secrecy. And obviously, you know, I didn't understand anything when I watched the Manhattan Project, what these people were trying to do, what they were putting on the chalkboard. I mean, it made no sense to me. How, I mean, this build, uh, creating an atomic bomb, rather complicated, isn't it, Sam? It's very complicated. Uh, you have the, the most amount of Nobel Prize winners in one place at one time, it's unbelievable. They were all very, not geniuses. They were all really very smart. Some were geniuses, but most of them were really smart and they developed it and they tested it. The Trinity test uh, proved that the plutonium bomb could work. Sam, in your book, you've got some amazing photos. You've got autographs. And I know from reading your preface in the book, you were always very careful in terms of showing it to people, people touching it. But now it's all in a book. It's much easier. I mean, this the, the to me, the photographs are almost worth the book itself. That must be a very special thing for you to be able to have those photographs so the world can see them now. Yeah, my plan is to donate it to uh, the University of Chicago. Um, there's about 30 pages in that book uh, that should have been in color. When I, when I spoke to the publisher, he said, if we do it in color, it's going to cost an extra twenty dollars to print, so it doesn't pay. So I said, "Okay, do it in black and white, no problem." No, well, it looks it looks very authentic with the black and white, and it's amazing. Um, so listen, Sam. Most of the major books on the Manhattan Project uh, that I've read about were published before 1973, and in the years that followed, uh, newly uh, declassified documents became available, and that showed many authors had included a huge amount of inaccuracies. What kind of inaccuracies were reported? prior to that i'll give you an example the biggest one was when uh, rose president roosevelt dies the story goes that uh, they tried to get hold of uh, truman they couldn't get a hold of him it took about two hours they bring him to the white house and uh, they swear him in as president and according to uh, the story uh, general stinson uh, who was secretary of war at the time goes to him and he says by the way you were working on an atomic bomb and this and this that's not a true story. The true story is two weeks after he's president of the United States, General Simpson writes him a letter and he says, uh, basically, I have a photocopy in the book. Uh, basically, he says, I'd like to meet with you on an urgent matter. Could you see me? And at the bottom of this letter, uh, Truman, in his own handwriting, tells the secretary, schedule a meeting for tomorrow morning. The next morning, he comes to the White House. And he arranges General Grove, who's head of the Manhattan Project, to also meet with the president. So the three of them meet. And for the first time, President Truman is told about the Manhattan Project and that we're working on an atomic bomb. And he's even given more or less a date when he believes the atomic bombs will be ready. That's the true story. But all of these books got everything wrong. There's a, there's a whole, and even some of the documents that came forward years later show that people made big mistakes. So I rectified most of the mistakes. <laughs> that's, that's, good. that's good to know. Uh, I'm curious for you to, to share with readers the fact that uh, you chronicle in the book, uh, the dawn of the atomic age, uh, and it sets the record straight on one of the, the greatest scientific advancements of all time. And that's how readers are going to see, they get to see in your book, a single letter from Albert Einstein to President Franklin Roosevelt in 1939 that led to the formation of the advisory committee 
Let me just get my notes here properly. The advisory committee on uranium and within six years to the uh, Manhattan Project that employed, like you said, 100,000 men and women. Can you elaborate on that? Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein didn't write the letter. Number one, he was presented the letter. He agreed to sign it. That was given by uh, an advisor to President uh, Roosevelt. There's an interesting story with that one. Uh, uh, I'll tell you the story. Part of it I put in the book. Part of it I didn't put in the book because it really, it's a nice story, but it doesn't really have to do a lot with uh, uh, the book. Um, the advisor went to um, uh, the president and he told him, listen, there's something called the... Um, the uh, Manhattan Project, they want to work on an atomic bomb dismissed. And Roosevelt said, uh, I'm not really interested, forget about it. And uh, the advisor said, you know what, we'll meet uh, the next morning. And they meet the next morning and he brings it up again. And this is how he brought it up to the president. I didn't put this in my book because it's a lengthy story, so I'll do it very fast. He says, at one time there was uh, an American who came to uh, Napoleon. And he told Napoleon, listen, I have an idea uh, about a boat without, uh, without sails. And Napoleon knew a lot about sails. He says, look, I'm not really interested in a boat without sails. Uh, I can't finance something like this. And Robert Fulton went back to the United States and invented the steamship. If Napoleon had had the steamship in his days, he would have conquered all of Europe. And he tells the story to Roosevelt and Roosevelt says, you know what, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a million dollars, work on your little project. And that's the foundation of the Manhattan Project. Wow. A million dollars. At the end, it ended up costing more than $2 billion in terms of 1939 money, which is a fortune today, really a fortune. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And the best part, it was kept secret from the Senate and the House of Representatives, only about three people actually knew that the books were cooked. Wow, that, that's, that's something. Yeah. Sam, one of the things I found in the book that I wasn't aware of, because I'm not really a historian on the atomic bomb and how, how it all evolved, but that uh, the US took over an island, Tinian. It was 12 hours from Japan, as you describe it, and they used that to train for the bombing. Like they, they took over a huge island. That was pretty, that's pretty fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Um, at, at, any, at any one time, there were more than 800 planes on that, uh, on that island. And one of the um, uh, arguments, personal arguments I had with my publisher, when I submitted the uh, uh, book, they gave it to about five or six uh, experts and the experts went through it to see if they could find the mistake. They all came out with one mistake. All of them with the same mistake. What was the mistake? They said when um, the atomic bombing took place on August 6, 1945, a day before a plane had landed and it crashed. And all the books that they read said one plane crashed the day before, that's why on the, uh, on the 6th, they were very careful, all this garbage. And I put down in my book, no, four planes crashed. And all of them said, no, you have proof. Uh, look at all these books. Only one plane crashed. And um, I went back to my books, and I said, there's, a, there's an autobiography of Tibbetts. And Tibbetts personally told me four planes crashed. So I photocopied uh, the page. I think it was page 153 in Tibbetts' autobiography. I sent it to them. I said, well, Tibbet says four planes crashed. What happened is one plane crashed into three other planes. So it's four planes that crashed. So they printed four planes. Little things like this, there was a lot of mistakes that people, uh, what happened, I think, uh, in the 1960s, 1970s, one author copied another author, or copied another right. author, and that was it. Yeah, well, I, I'm sure in the in the years to come, many authors will be copying Sam Clota. So hopefully, hopefully for the for the better. Uh, Sam, I was also interested in noticing that you were kept referring to the bomb that it had a nickname that it was known as Little Boy. That's quite a nickname for the uh, for an atomic bomb. Yeah, there's there's different stories why they called the Little Boy and even the the uh, Nagasaki 
a plum. They said it was called Fat Man because of Churchill. I don't think so. It was just they, they didn't have really an At first, it was called the gadget. When they tested the bomb in uh, at Trinity, uh, they called it a gadget. They really didn't have a name for it. And the first bombing that we, they tested, the uh, first bomb they tested was the plutonium bomb. They were more interested in testing the plutonium rather than the uranium bomb. So Sam, I also fascinated that you actually met the pilot. You met the radio operator of the Enola Gay, which dropped the bombs. What, what kind of questions were you able to ask them? The radio operator didn't, the bombardier dropped the bomb. Okay, but uh, how, what was it like? I mean, the, I understand that, but you, you, the radio operator, I'm saying, the radio operator of the Enola Gay, someone who played a very important role. Yeah, you met all, him? I met all of them. Yeah, and what was it? What, were the, what was the opportunity? I mean, it would be like me uh, getting in a room when I was, you know, one of my bucket list items, getting in a room with Wayne Gretzky and getting yeah. to talk to him for a half hour about the NHL. What was it like to be with these people and, and what kind of questions were you able to ask them? The... Um... First person I met was General Tibbetts. Uh, I met him in Washington. He gave a speech. And after that, I bit by bit, I met everybody. I went to see them. Uh, they invited me to uh, several of their uh, get togethers. Every uh, few years they got together, they invited me and I would uh, speak to them, take pictures, get autographs, and we kept correspondence uh, till the day they died. Uh, it was great. Uh, and they answered all my questions. Tibbetts went to just about everybody and said, look, Sam has this classification with the Air Force. Uh, you can tell them anything you want. Uh, I, was, I was interested because I knew about atomic bombs. I knew there were nine steps to um, actually uh, setting off the atomic bomb. And I knew they had to have skipped one step to make it uh, safer and uh, bit by bit, I found out exactly how it was done. It was fascinating for me to find out. I'm sure it was. Now, in the news, the last several weeks, we've all watched in horror what's happening in Ukraine with Russia. Uh, do you worry, should we worry, that Russia will use an atomic bomb or anything similar to that? I don't think uh, Putin is stupid enough to use an atomic bomb uh, because uh, I think uh, half of the world will be destroyed. Um, the only thing I know that Russia used in the last uh, two weeks that is not uh, legal is they used uh, what's called the uh, Moab bomb. Um, Moab does not stand for uh, mothers of all uh, bombs, uh, it stands for a massive ordnance uh, airburst. Um, what it is basically is, um, if you can imagine um, a four, four to five uh, diameter bomb, the outside of this diameter bomb uh, has uh, very fine aluminum powder. I mean, really fine, like uh, not sugar, but granulate little, little pieces of an outer coating. The inner coating is um, uh, C2H4O, um, it's um, ethylene oxide. When these two elements come together, you have uh, an explosion that is unbelievable. It's, it's, um, it basically warms up the air and then burns everything. So it will burn a house, it will burn people. If they throw it in an apartment building, uh, everybody will everybody in that building will die. Um, it, it's a very dangerous uh, chemical. It's outlawed uh, by, by the world authorities, um, but he's using it. And uh, he, may, he may use uh, chemicals, uh, nerve gas. And, I mean, if he sees he's gonna lose, uh, he, will, he will do something. I don't think he will use atomic bombs. Well, you know, we all live in, everyone in the world lives in fear that North Korea, now Russia, who knows what other country could be, um, Iran will use, you know, nuclear weapons. And um, it is kind of hard to believe when I read your book, brought me back to all the history that I read about the atomic bomb. 
It is, I know they dropped leaflets and they warned people to leave, but the United States still dropped an atomic bomb and killed the God knows how many innocent people, Sam. I know they had reasons for doing it, but it's still hard to no, fathom. When I, when I wrote the book, I didn't put down my opinion. I just put down the facts. But the, the most important fact, uh, you know, reading um, when I was in Minneapolis, um, I saw documents, um, uh, sorry, not in the, uh, Independence, Missouri. I saw documents uh, in his own handwriting, in Truman's handwriting. There's a lot of, uh, he kept notes every day in longhand with pen. It's amazing. He was afraid um, of having a million body bags, dead American soldiers brought to the United States. That was his huge fear. Um, General MacArthur wanted to be the head of the invasion of Japan. And they asked uh, MacArthur, how many people do you think will die? And he said on the American side, 100,000, on the Japanese side, half a million to a million. The real numbers that the United States said was at least 1 million Americans would die and three to 5 million Japanese would die. That was based on the invasion of Iwo Jima and Okinawa, how many people died. And Truman wrote, he can't, he couldn't have a million body bags brought to the United States. They had to figure a way to save American lives and Japanese lives. So it was his call. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I hope we don't ever see this in our lifetime. Just to, 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 to conclude here, Sam, uh, you were a teacher for many years. Uh, and I know, was I think you were a math teacher? Did you teach math? I was. I taught grade ten and grade eleven math uh, for nineteen years. So. Now, did 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 you ever discuss the atomic bomb with your students? Never. Really? Okay. It would it would no, be an interesting subject. No, I never discussed it with anybody. It was secret. And and as a financial advisor, I imagine you never discussed it with your clients either. Nobody. Nobody. So, so now, if it wasn't for COVID, it would still be a secret. Okay, but so now you've written this book. What's next? I mean, it's a great book. It really is a great book, and I'm sure there'll be lots of people that will want to talk to you about it. Um, do you have any further plans to 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 work on this project in any way? On this one, no. I'm writing another book. Uh, I started writing it in 2009 on um, CIBC and Enron. Okay. That should be uh, all right. So it could be the the Sam Cloda collection, and uh, Sam only will see his wife uh, for dinner uh, again for perhaps the next couple of years. You know, it's like you know, it's like uh, parents tell their students, "Work on your homework, but don't watch TV, don't have music in the background, concentrate." When I when I was a teacher, I told my students, "When you go home, don't listen to music in the background, concentrate on doing your homework." And uh, yeah. When you're writing a book, uh, yeah, it's a full-time job. Well, Sam, it, it's a great book. Uh, thanks for giving us the time. Uh, I know you live in Hampstead, but we Hampstead's definitely part of our Colt St. Luke library community. Uh, I'm sure people will enjoy it, and uh, we'll stay in touch. So thanks for your time. My pleasure. Take care. Thanks. Sam Cloda has been our guest.